Assalamualaikum and hello everyone. Uh, I'm Muhammad Alamin from Malaysia Positivity Corporation. I think we get to start my introduction here. Uh, we had about uh, 151 participants registered uh, for the webinar and hopefully more people to join in the next few minutes. Welcome to JRP webinar series on the topic of Understanding Malaysia Regulations Part 1 organized by MPC. This JRP webinar series is a platform where we bring experts to share information and best practices regarding good regulatory practice. It covers various topics to help policymakers, regulators, businesses, academia, and interested parties to enhance knowledge on how to improve the quality of reg regulation without slowing economic growth, innovation, competitiveness, and job creation. Government mainly have, which is number one, is to collect money through taxes. Uh, second one is spending money for development, infrastructure, infrastructures, and public goods. And third one, to regulate, to protect safety, health, environment, welfare, and public goods. Thus, understanding nation's legal system is a fundamental for those who are uh, interested to improve the quality of regulation. Today's topic is about understanding nation regulation. The main objective of these sessions is to provide an overview of the nation legal system and the lawmaking process of regulation, and as a refresher for those who already know about regulation. We divided into two parts, where part one, we talk about uh, focusing on the Malaysian legal system and fundamentals on primary and subsidiary regulation. And part two, which is next week, will be more focused on legislative process and common features of regulations. I would like to welcome our speakers today, Ms. Leah Safura Abdul Rashid and Ms. Nick Shafika Nick Ibrahim from Zahid Ibrahim which is a law firm. Lia Sofura is a senior associate in the corporate and government advisory practice group at Zico, a member of the law. She admitted to the bar in 2014 and thereafter was awarded with the prestigious Chevening Scholarship by the UK High Commission to, push, to pursue her master's degrees at the Queen Mary University of London. Leah has been building her capability in law reform by advising select federal ministries and government agencies in regulatory mapping and conducting feasible studies in relation to the review of primary and subsidy legislation, which is involved, among others, conducting key stakeholders engagements and proposing policy recommendations. On the law reform, she advised on matters relating to compliance and governance in particular, advising GLCs and statutory bodies on board roles and responsibility reporting, as well as assisting clients to develop compliance programs and processes, including the drafting of various corporate documentation, such as constitutions, guidelines, standards, operating procedures, and to, to name a few. Today, Lia has co-authored articles relating to the sharing economy, which, which is has been published by Praxis, the Malaysian Bar Publication, as well as contributed in Islamic finance academic textbooks and written in the Malaysia, Malaysia Islamic Finance Report by Thomson Rutter. Outside of the office, Lia is actively involved in civil societies, addressing current issues relating to ethics and governance in Malaysia. Shafika, senior associate in the Corporate and govern, Government Advisory Practice Group at Zaid Ibrahim & Co, a member of Zico Law. She graduated from University of Tanuji Mara in 2017 and was admitted to the bar in 2018 as an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya. She has been actively involved in advising the federal government and state government, including various ministries, agencies, and statutory bodies on law reform in particular on conducting regulatory impact analysis and preparing regulatory impact statements. She also has advice on regulatory mapping, feasibility studies, on reducing 
regulatory burden as well as the regulation of law. She also specialized in providing legal advisory services for startup and small and medium enterprise. Realizing the importance of digital technology, she has collaborated with Shekup, uh, an online legal platform to provide legal and professional services online. In addition, uh, as a founding member of Zico Labs, which is Zico Law's regional, regional CSR to support the start, startup scale up ecosystem, she has conducted training and awareness session on various legal matters, ranging from legal clinics to panel sessions in testing these organizations. At the same time, she also worked with regulators, accelerators such as MDEC to supercharge the growth of Malaysia's startup ecosystem. During the webinar, during the webinar, participants are invited to send questions via the question box. So please, if you have any questions and clarification, send it to the question box. The speaker at the end of the session will address some of the questions received. We may not have the time to discuss all of them, but I will group or select some of the questions to represent some of your questions. This webinar is being recorded and will publish in our website when in ready within the next few days. So with that, I would like to invite Nick Shafika to do his presentation. Please, Nick Shafika, thank you. All right, many thanks, Encik Alamin. Hi, my name is Nick Shafika. So just now I asked Encik Alamin, so kita nak serious ke informal? And then he said, kita serious, but then relax. So don't be scared. I know we're talking about regulations today. We're wearing blazers, but actually kat bawah kita tengah pakai shorts. So boleh je kalau korang nak makan kat belakang tu. We'll try to make this as entertaining but informative. Okay. So for this particular seminar, we'll be uh, discussing on uh, Malaysian regulations, but just the general overview. Uh, next, please. So um, next, please. So for the outline, uh, first we will be discussing on federal constitution, and then um, we will be discussing on the legislative, executive, and the judicial authority. And lastly, we'll be discussing on the legislation. So we will explain the definition of the scope of each of these re regulations. All right. Okay, so first is the federal constitution. So um, what is the federal constitution? So federal constitution is actually the supreme law of the federation. If you look at Article 4, jangan takut, <laughs> Article 4, Section 1 of the federal constitution, it states that this constitution is the supreme law of the federation and any law passed after Merdeka Day which is inconsistent with this constitution shall to the extent of the inconsistency be what. So this particular act is the main act, the Macam Ibu Act in Malaysia. So all um, laws passed in Malaysia, it has to be in line with federal constitution. So if it's against the federal constitution, then it will be considered as unconstitutional. And Article 32, Subsection 1 states that there shall be a supreme head of the federation and it should be called the Yang Diputuan Agong. He's the macam, head of all of the bodies in Malaysia. So for the federal constitution, under federal constitution, there's um, for the government in Malaysia, there's three types of government bodies. First is legislative, second is executive, and third is judiciary. So if you want to um, look into this further, you can refer to the relevant subsection up listed under this. So uh, just um, in a nutshell, legislatively, what they do is that they legislate the law, meaning that they actually make the law. Executive is they execute the law, and judiciary is all the courts whereby they will implement the law. Okay, so first I'll be discussing on the legislative authority. So who's inside legislative authority? So legislative authority of the Federation shall be vested in the Parliament. So Parliament consists of Yang Diputuan Agong, Dewan Negara and also Dewan Rakyat. So for Yang Diputuan Agong, as you all know, um, every five years, there will be rotation out of the nine rulers in Malaysia. For Dewan Negara pula is the, um, all of the, um, representative that we have elected during general election and for that sorry that's the one yeah the one negara is the senators appointed by ydpa okay. so um 
legislative body, the power is to legislate, pass, amend or repeal federal laws, matters under the federal list. So the power is determined under the federal constitution. So for federal laws, it is made by the parliament, but for state laws, it is made by the legislature of the state, which is, which is the state legislature. So for the process, there's two steps. First is the pre-parliamentary stage, and second is the parliamentary stage. So for pre-parliamentary stage, before any ministers want to make any laws, they will have a government proposal, like internal government proposal, whereby, okay, they, they decide that, oh, maybe we should have an, a particular, regu particular act on this particular topic. And after that, they have to conduct a regulatory impact analysis. So based on the um, national policy on the development and implement implementation of regulation, it states that before you actually amend or create new law, you have to undergo regulatory impact analysis, whereby you have to explain why do you need this law and you have to conduct public consultation and conduct cost benefit analysis to explain in detail as to the reason why we should introduce a new regulations. And after that, they will be meeting relevant government authorities to discuss further on the need to have the laws. And after that, they will draft the bill. The bill is before you pass a law, you have to draft um, the bill first. So the bill normally is drafted internally by the respective ministries, but after that, they will pass it to the AG, Attorney General. And cabinet will have to approve the bill before it becomes an act. So that is before the masuk parliament. So during the parliamentary stage, we can refer to the next slide. So there's seven steps. So first, um, once the draft bill is ready, they will bring it to the one right whereby they will have the first reading. They, at this point, they will just read the title. And then after that, they will have the second reading where they will lay down the principles of the laws. And if it is approved by a majority of the members, it will be passed to the committee stage, whereby they will deliberate further, and it will be passed to the they want right again for the third reading, whereby they have to approve the particular bill. When it has been approved by the one right it will be brought to the one agaro, whereby they will go through all the same process again: first reading, second reading, committee stage, and the third reading. So once the one agaro has already approved that, they will pass it back to the one right and the one rakyat will pass it to YDPA. So all laws in Malaysia has to be um, presented by the YDPA. They ha he has to ascend on it. So within 30 days after the bill has been passed, um, he has to ascend on it. And then after that, baru dia akan publicize it. So like I mentioned earlier, um, the parliament will only draft legislations for the federal state and also all of the states in Malaysia, but then there's two lists in Malaysia, which is the federal list and the state list. So federal list meaning, so that meaning the parliament gets to draft all of the laws with respect to any matters enumerated in the federal list or the concurrent list. And um, for the state pula, they, the legislature of a state may make laws with respect to any matters enumerated in the state list or the concurrent list. So for this particular, the relationship, for this your relationship between the federation and the state for federal list name parliament they can only make laws yang ada dalam federal list whereby the state legislature they can only make the regulations and laws stated under the state list but there's also um some overlap whereby they can one of them can make it either or that is stated under article 74 of the federal constitution so let's take a look at the list itself on the next slide. Okay, so for federal lists, it consists, consists of external affairs, defense of the federation, internal security, civil law, criminal criminal law, and all of this. So for criminal law, memo federal law, you can act, actually make the law and amend or repeal the law. State memang tak boleh buat any law relating to criminal law. So for example, the state pula, they can make all of the laws in relation to state government, Islamic law, Malay custom, Islam, local government, so this is fun fact, okay, like that fun place is a fact. Islamic law, for example, the Sharia court. Um, so setiap state in Malaysia has their own Sharia court and also has their own act pertaining to Islamic law. So katalah Kelantan ke, Terengganu ke, all of these state, they have their own laws pertaining to Islamic law. For concurrent list ni, either or can do it. 
However, uh, the state too must ensure that it is in line with the federal constitution. So if it is not in line, then it will be unconstitutional. So apapun pun kalau ada macam um, bercanggah, the federal one will take will be more powerful lah. So yang state two chapter battle. That is for the West of Malaysia and for Sabah and Sarawak, they have a supplement to state list for states of Sabah and Sarawak. It includes native law and customs. So because in Sabah and Sarawak, it's a bit special. They have like their own native law, they have their own law. So in that sense, they get to make their own laws. Same goes with the next list. which is the supplement to concurrent list for states of Sabah and Sarawak, which is the same thing as the federal punya concurrent list, whereby you all can do it. So that is for legislative, whereby they have the power to make the law, amend the law, or repeal the law. So who will execute it? It will be the executive authority. So it consists of YDPA as the head. Actually, YDPA is the head of all three bodies, and also the Malaysian cabinet. My dad is like so excited. I think he's watching this. So, hi, daddy. He actually like cut this for me. So, this is the new Malaysian cabinet. Okay. So, moving on. Who, uh, what is the executive body? So, executive body is the body that actually execute the law. So, it is led by the prime minister who is appointed by YDPA. And Prime Minister, as you all know, leads the government because they, like he's the party, the, his party holds the majority in parliament. So although the executive power is vested with the YDPA, YDPA is required to act based on the advice of the cabinet of the ministers or the advice of the minister empowered by the cabinet. So usually the Prime Minister will advise him and he will act upon it. So that's why usually kalau macam every few days now we see, see say, Okay, we will see like um, our Prime Minister on news and he will say just stay at home. But really stay at home, okay? Okay, that's with the executive authority. Now we're moving forward to the judicial authority. So judicial authority consists of the judiciary. Judiciary is all of the courts in Malaysia. So kita dah ada orang buat law, kita dah ada orang actually um, execute the law. So, kalau ada ada salah, where do we go? So, we go to the judicial authority. So, um, based on Article 121 of the Federal Constitution, it states that there shall be two high courts of the coordinate jurisdiction, with being the High Court of Malaya and also high, high Court of Sabah and Sarawak. And such inferior courts as may be provided by federal law. So, this is the hierarchy of courts. So, first and paling tinggi is the federal court. Second is the Court of Appeal, and third is High Court of Malaya and Sabah and Sarawak. So High Court and Sabah and Sarawak are different. It, so, for example, I'm a lawyer admitted in the High Court of Malaya, but I can't practice in High Court of Sabah and Sarawak, meaning that I can't go to their court and actually represent my client because I because it's separate jurisdiction. So this is considered the Superior Court, Federal Court, Court of Appeal, and High Court of Malaya. But then, kat bawah tu, it's their Session Court. Magistrate's Court and also Penghulu Court. So Sessions Court, Magistrate's Court and Penghulu Court ni, they are called sub subordinate courts because they are under the Superior Court. So, apa-apa decision made by the Federal Court, Korupi yang court that is higher than them, then they are bound by it. So, right now I will explain on the power of each of the courts. So, we'll, we'll start with the Superior Court itself. So for federal court, they have four main jurisdiction. First is the original jurisdiction. Original meaning that they have the power to hear the case for the first time. So for federal court, it's located in Putrajaya, but it's only for, for the original jurisdiction is uh, any matters in relation to federal constitution. Firstly, like if you feel that a law is against the federal federal constitution, so we go to the federal court. And secondly, if there's a dispute between the federal and also the state, so we go to federal court to solve that. 
And the second jurisdiction is the appellate jurisdiction. Appellate ni meaning that they have the power to hear the appeal. So like I've said earlier, Malaysia ni is based on the hierarchy system. Kan? So they get to hear the appeal from the Court of Appeal and High Court. So from High Court, if um, the orang dekat situ tak puas hati, they will appeal to the Court of Appeal and then after that, Court of, kalau tak puas hati juga, we go to federal court. So that is appellate jurisdiction. And third is referral jurisdiction. Referral is just, um, they are point of reference. So kalau Court of Appeal of High Court nak interpret certain laws, probably federal constitution, they will go to federal court. And same goes for advisory jurisdiction, whereby for this one, um, in particular, if YDPA uh, has any question in relation to federal constitution, he will go to the federal court to interpret the laws. So the second one is court of appeal. So under court of appeal, their power is just <clears throat> the number of appeal. So the power memang appellate jurisdiction je. So they will hear and determine appeals from any judgment or order of any high court. So from high court, for orang tak puas hati, they will go to court of appeal. And if tak puas, like I said earlier, if tak puas hati, you can go to federal court. And then from high court, okay, that's my picture. So I just nak look at this really. So their first power is or their original jurisdiction in, in practice. They boleh dengar any case, but in practice, they will only determine case where the amount involved exceeds 250,000. That is for civil matter. But for criminal matters, they will only try matters that is punishable with death and very serious offenses. Like it must be brief. Then very you pergi dekat high court. If not, you just go to the subordinate courts. So for their appellate jurisdiction, they get to hear the appeal from the high court from the Sessions Court and also Magistrate Court. And for the revisionary and supervisory jurisdiction, it means that they can also actually um, supervise and revise the decision made by the Sessions Court and also the Magistrate's Court. Okay, so for Sessions Court, if you have any questions, you can just post on the right-hand side on the, on the chat column. Okay, so for Sessions Court, their original jurisdiction is to hear and determine matters concerning motor vehicles, accident, landlords, tenants, and distress. But for other civil matters, the amount of value should be less than 250000 So if it's above 250000 you go straight to High Court, but if it's below, then you go to Sessions Court. But for criminal matters, they get to try all. And they also have supervisory jurisdiction whereby they can supervise the magistrate's court. At any time, they can just um, check valid the decisions made by the magistrate's court and see whether it's in line with the laws. And then under session court, there's magistrate's court. So for normal people, they will just go to magistrate's court because for civil matters, any amount in dispute value of the subject matter that does not exceed 25,000, you can just go to magistrate's court. And for criminal matters, pula, it, they can go to magistrate's court in relation to all offenses punishable with imprisonment or with a fine only. But if that, you go to high court. And then appellate jurisdiction, ni, they actually have the power to hear the appeal from the Pahulu Court. Tapi Pahulu Court ni zaman dulu-dulu lah. Sekarang actually dah abolished. So last time in West Malaysia, kita ada penghulu court. So original jurisdiction dia limited to proceedings, which all the parties are person of an Asian race and who speaks and understands the Malay language. So untuk civil matter, plaintiff boleh seek rec to recover a debt of not exceeding lima puluh ringgit je. But for criminal matters, for minor offenses, which can be adequately punished by a fine not more than 25 ringgit. So dah tak ada lah sekarang, but then that's the Malaysian punya hierarchy system. Maybe there's a third to part other. Okay, so um, that's the main court in federal. We also have state courts and also like courts of special jurisdiction. Deka, okay, the federal level juga. We also have two special courts. It's called special court and also court for children. Special court ni is for YDPA and all of the rulers in Malaysia. Semua raja raja. So if they've committed like an offense based on their personal capacity. They cannot go to much high court or federal court. So 
they have to go to courts of special jurisdiction, which is called the special court, made specially for YDPA and also the rulers in Malaysia. And secondly, is court for children. Court for children is for um, around below 18 years old. So they don't have to go to normal court because under the law, you attain the age of majority at 18. So below that, you consider a child again. So you need a proper environment. Lah. So kalau pergi court of children ni, it's private, meaning that reporters, some unknown people cannot go in the court. And then they get to invite their parents and the judge will actually interview the parents to tanya pasal anak dia, like, oh, anak you baik tak, semua. So they're more lenient in that way. So if, because, yelah, for judge pun, dia tak sampai hati nak punish the child. Tapi kalau dia, the kesalahan is very grave, they will send them, dia tak masuk prison, but they actually masuk a Henry Gurney school. But if not, kalau setakat macam mencuri, bila kecil-kecil macam tu, um, they will just, macam dalam probation. So another court is the state court, like I've mentioned earlier. Dekat Malaysia ni, kalau under the state list kan, for example, the Sharia matters, macam Islamic law tadi, setiap negara dekat Malaysia have their own law. So if you commit an offence dekat Melaka, so it's under the Melaka law, so pergi dekat Sharia court dekat Melaka. But this is only in relation to matters under Islamic law lah. And then, so for my side juga, if I want to practice or do Sharia law, then I have to take the exam in federal territories. So if I have the certificate, I can only practice in federal territories. I can't go to um, Terengganu ke, Lantan ke, because they have their own law. So if I want to practice in Terengganu, I have to go to Terengganu and take the exam again. If I want to practice in Kelantan, I have to go to Kelantan and take the exam there. And secondly is the native court. This one is in Sabah and Sarawak because they're all the, all the natives. So they are very special. They have their own native court because they have their own customary laws. And kita pun tak tahu. Right. So that's with the power of the authorities in Malaysia. Now I will explain on legislation. So what is legislation? So selalu orang ada confused about this. So legislation is dibagi kepada dua, which is the primary legislation and also the subsidiary legislation. Primary legislation is the main act. So for this one, I will only be discussing on the federal government context. So what is the primary legislation? So primary legislation is an act passed by the parliament. Pa parliament, um, yang tadi I mentioned earlier, so they will actually draft the law, so they will pass it. So the main act is called the primary legislation. So the authority that can do, do that is parliament. So as an example, Malaysia Productivity Corporation Act to incorporate NPC itself, uh, that is an act passed by the parliament. So for subsidiary legislation pula, it's more like um, to supplement the primary legislation so because primary legislation, we only explain the broad principles, but the, uh, the detailed principles will be explained in the regulation itself, which is called the subsidiary legislation. So, subsidiary legislation is the laws made under an act. So, the person who gets to do it is the minister in charge or any other relevant authorities or bodies under the primary legislation. Example is Malaysia Productivity Corporation, Conduct and Discipline Rules 1998. So, yang main act is MPC Act itself, but then under MPC Act, dia ada anak dia, which is Malaysia Productivity Corporation Conduct and Discipline Rules, whereby they will explain in detail about the conduct and discipline of the officers dekat dalam tu. But, uh, under the Interpretation Act, subsidiary legislation ni, it means proclamation, rule, regulation, order, notification, bylaws, or other instrument made under any act, enactment, ordinance, or other lawful authority and having legislative effect. So, you may ask, tak pula tanya di sini, oh, apa tu act, enactment, and ordinance, apa beza dia? So, act is made by parliament at the federal level. So, parliament yang akan buat a federal, the federal law, so it's called an act. But before 1959, it is called ordinance. So after that, we call them acts. And then for, tapi dekat state, for example, dekat Kelantan, they will call it enactment instead of act. 
but I will explain further later. And then ordinance pula, another term that is used by this um, Sarawak punya executive exactly, whereby they will call their main act ordinance. But for subsidiary legislation, it does not include terms of reference, standard operating procedures, manual, administrative documents, charter, contracts, constitution, because that's this like personal contract of the respective agencies or some company, your company maybe are the like your own contract. So that is not considered as subsidiary legislation. That is just macam a supplement punya law, tapi dia tak ada that power. Okay, so I will explain here. Okay, so firstly, if you look on the right, so parliament will actually, for this for federal, yeah, they will pass the primary legislation being the Prevention and Control of Infectious Disease Act 1988, which is Act 342 as the primary legislation because sekarang kan we are under MCO. So it's under this act lah. So it's under the Ministry of Health. So this act, the Lama Dada in 1988, so it will give power to the minister in charge or any other relevant authorities bodies to make subsidiary legislation being for MCO in particular is the prevention and control of disease, diseases measures within the infected local areas regulation 2020. So all this while, like all of the things that we see online, upper young PM announced, semua tu dah gazetted and memang ada law. So they are made under pursuant to this act primary legislation. But they call it um, so regulation. So regulate primary acne can have satu je, but but they put in subsidiary regulation. Memang this um, it's unlimited lah. So the person who gets to draft it is minister in charge. So kalau, if you want to draft an act, it will take a really long time because you have to go to parliament and undergo like the process I mentioned earlier. But regulations ni it will take as long. Okay. So, just want to show you for the next slide. Okay, this is a sample of the Prevention and Control of Infectious Disease Act 1988, which being the primary act. If you look at the section bawah bawah, usually there will be a clause to say power to make regulations. So, if you click on it, the power make to make regulation, it will say that the minister may make regulations. So the act itself memang dah bagi the power to the minister to actually make the law, the regulations. So that's why cepat je. Okay, that is for the federal law. And then moving forward to the to the state punya law that I've mentioned earlier, primary legislations is called enactment or ordinance. Enactment is um this all of the states in Malaysia kalau the state make their own laws, except for Sarawak. Sarawak, they call it ordinance. And it is made by the state legislative assembly, being the dun lah, they want dengan negeri. So for example, in Kelantan, they have the river and drainage enactment. So for subsidiary legislation, it's laws made under the enactment and ordinance. So sama je lah macam principal tadi. But the authority that will get to do it is ruler in council or any other relevant state authorities or bodies. So example, um, for tadi river drainage and drainage enactment, so bawah dia, they have like river and drainage rules. So that's it from me. My colleague will take over from here, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi Shahli, Sari Wayasili, Amri, Wahdu Mudatani, Sari Yafqaw Kauli. Assalamualaikum and hi everyone. Um, Sorry, first and foremost, before I start, I just want to say that I'm very happy to be here. And thank you so much for attending our talk. And for now, and also thank you, Nick, for laying out the foundations in relation to Malaysian legal system, as well as the definition on primary and subsidiary legislation. I understand that um, moving on, I'll be speaking on the scope of primary and subsidiary legislation, as well as a few other um, principles under this topic. And I just want to say that some of the things that I'll be presenting might overlap with what Nick has presented before, but I felt like those uh, points are very important and it should be recapped and reiterated throughout this presentation. So moving on, let's just take a look at the varying types of primary legislations that we have. Um, so if you look into the blue boxes here, we have three types of primary legislations, as Nick has explained before. We have Act enactment and ordinances. So how do we actually vary and identify and differentiate the varying types of um, primary legislation? 
So the way to do it is to actually to look into the scope as well as the leg legislative authority um, that are allowed and empowered to actually make these laws. So let's take a look at what we can see from this slide. So for the scope of act, we can see that these are federal laws enacted by the parliament and respectively, the legislative authority is the parliament itself. So for enactment, as Nick has mentioned as well before, it, they're basically state laws based, passed by state authority. And uh, the legislative authority would be the state legislative assemblies and except for the state of Sarawak. And the reason why I have to highlight that it is except for the state of Sarawak is because the primary legislations for Sarawak are only called ordinances. In contrast, for Sabah, the primary legislations are called both enactments and ordinances. So that relates to the third category of primary legislation, which is the ordinance. So ordinances could be laws for Sabah and Sarawak, or it could be laws enacted by the federal legislature between 1st April 1946 and 10 September 1959. So this is basically all of your pre-medical laws or ordinances could also be laws promulgated by the YDPA during an emergency. So who is the legislative authority for the ordinances? Respectively, as I mentioned, there are state legislative assemblies of both Sabah and Sarawak, and the federal legislature between 1946 and 1953, as well as YDPA by virtue of Article 150 of the federal constitution. So now that we understand the varying types of primary legislation, I would just like to zoom into the act and the types of acts that we have. If we go into the next slide, please. So the next slide, stop, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think I jumped the gun for a bit. So basically, these are some of the examples in relation to primary legislation. Um, so for act, we have the typical companies act, which everyone is very familiar with, and the Drainage Drugs Act 1952, as well as the Married Women and Children Maintenance Act 1950. For enactment, like I said, these are generally um, primary legislations for states. So we have here the Kedah Water Resources Enactment 2008, Wakaf State of Sabah Enactment 2018. As you can see, Sabah actually has laws that uses the, um, the title enactment, um, as well as the State Public Service Commission Enactment 1991. So what do we have for ordinance? Moving on. So we have Emergency Public Order and Prevention of Crime Ordinance 1969. And then we can see that we have Sabah Land Ordinance, CAP 68, Sarawak River Ordinance 1993, and Carrying of Arms Ordinance 1947, which was made um, due, like before the Medica was granted to us, I suppose. So can, um, and moving on. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned just now, we just like to zoom into the varying types of acts that we have. Um, so we have four types of varying acts, namely uh, the first one is the Principal Act, second is the Amendment Act, um, the third is the Revised Act, and the fourth is the Consolidated Act. So what does this even mean? So Principal Act is the most common type of primary legislation that we have. For example, it's the Companies Act 2016. An Amendment Act, it makes changes to the Principal Act, and it should also go through the Parliament if you actually want to make any amendments to the Primary Act. So here we actually have, so Companies Act has been amended, and the Amendment Act was Companies Amendment Act 2019. So the third one is the Revised Act, and this results from changes limited to only typographical, grammatical, or like um, things that doesn't actually affect the substance of the legislation itself. Then if you actually have um, like a number of typos, instead of making amendments, you'll just publish a new one, which is called the Revised Act. And the fourth one and the last one, we have um, Consolidated Act, which brings two or more acts on a specific subject matter, which had been passed over a period of time. So the, the example that we use here is the Interpretations Act 1948 and 1967. So these are consolidated um, primary legislations in relation to Interpretation Act. And also I'd just like to highlight that Interpretation Act is very, very fundamental in, really, um, in trying to scope out the scope of primary and subsidiary legislations because all of the interpretations are included in under the provisions under the Interpretation Act. That is a side fact, but let's move on to some of the examples that we have for all of this. 
So for primary legislation, the Principal and Amendment Act, uh, we did a bit of a check uh, on the depository, on the numbers of Principal Acts and Amendment Acts that we have in Malaysia. So as we can see, if you look into the AG, Chambers actually have um, uh, a portal where you can look into all of the laws in Malaysia, in particular only for the primary legislation. So if you look into the website, at the end of it, you can see that we have 828 uh, sorry, 821 principal acts in Malaysia, and these are all acts that are already enforced. So there are also acts that have yet to be enforced, but they um, are, those are the ones that we don't actually include in the number of principles acts in Malaysia. So for number of amendment acts pula, um, I put here not available, not because we don't have any, of course we have plenty of amendment acts in Malaysia, especially considering that legislations are meant to be reviewed from time to time, ideally every five years. Um, the reason why we can't really ascertain the number of amendment acts is because um, it's really difficult um, and you actually have to go through. Um, so the, the AG Chambers um, website wouldn't actually have the breakdown of those things. So you need to look into certain search engine and look into the primary legislation and then you look into the amendment act. So for me to actually find out the numbers, it will be very, very difficult. Um, but maybe if anyone has the answer, I would like to know if you can post it in the question box. I'll be very interested to learn about the number of amendment acts that we have in Malaysia. So can, if we move on to the next slide as well, we will be looking into the revised and consolidated act. So the number of revised acts that we have in Malaysia are 28. So these are some of the examples that we have, which is the statutory declaration act that was revised as well as the pool betting act 1967 that was revised. For number of consolidated, consolidated acts, we only have one, which is the interpretation act 1948 and 1967. Okay, everyone should bear with me. We're trying to change the slides, yeah. So now that we have covered the primary legislation, let's take a look at the subsidy legislation. So for subsidy legislations, uh, if you can remember how I presented on the primary legislation, we could see like there are varying legislative authority for the different types of primary legislation. But for subsidy legislation, it is the same as well. But because, um, I think I will explain this a little bit more in detail um, in one minute, but let me just take a look at the legislative authority. So because subsidy legislations are made through powers delegated by the legislature to a body of persons via an enabling or parent statute. So what this means is once the primary legislation has been passed in the parliament, it has a provision that gives the power to an implementing agency typically um, maybe certain department or government agencies in the federal ministry to implement the provisions under that particular act. And because they have the power as an implementing agency, typically, not typically, it should be that um, under each of the sub, sub, sorry, under each of the primary legislations, you will be able to take a look at the provisions where such implementation authority would have the power to make such legislation. So it could be passed by a minister, it could be passed by um, the government agencies, um, et cetera, et cetera. So why do we actually need um, subsidy legislation? So the general rationale why we need subsidy legislation is the fact that the principal acts are typically intended to cover general principles of the law only. Um, and that is because um, if you, the, the general principles of the law would regulate certain activities, but in relation to the nitty gritty and the details of, for example, um, if you look into Tourism Industry Act, we have a provision where if you want to carry out activities relating to tourism, you have to be registered um, and licensed by the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. So, but the procedures and the nitty gritty details in relation to the application for the license or the requirement for the licenses are all stipulated either in the regulations or in their guidelines. So generally, this is why we need subsidy legislation as an act to supplement the primary legislation so that it's easier for people to have better clarity. Um, and for um, and most importantly, because it is very difficult to pass amendments 
to the um, primary legislation because you have to go through the parliament, you have to get royal assent and stuff like that. So that is why it's easier for you to just pass the subsidy legislations if you need to regulate certain activities and provide more details on the provisions under the primary legislations. So because the implementing agency now have a bit, a lot of power to pass their own laws, um, we do have control over subsidy legislation. Namely, um, we have judicial control, um, legislative control, as well as consultation. So um, let me just take a look at the first one will be the judicial control. It's basically where the, the court has the power for judicial review. Um, what do we mean by this, right? So judicial control is where um, sometimes due to maybe um, lack of clarity in the law, um, there could be time where implementing agencies might conduct themselves in an ultra virus manner, meaning to say that they don't have a power, for example, to impose certain fees, but they still impose certain fees by passing through a subsidy legislation. So when that happens, um, the public can actually contest and go to the, go to the court and contest on the on the number one applicability um, of the of the provision since it is not within um, within the scope of the primary legislation. And secondly, it could also be that the subject matter is unconstitutional. So if it's unconstitutional, that is also a matter that is up for judicial review. Um, so. Other than judicial review, which is for me is one of the most um, fundamental and important um, control that we have in trying to make sure that subsidy legislation fulfill the full intention of the primary legislation. We also have legislative control. So uh, what, what do we mean by legislative control? So the delegated powers by an enabling statute may be repealed or varied by the parliament. How can they do this particular thing, right? If we say that the legislative authority for subsidy legislations are um, the implementation authorities, so how do we actually still, how would the parliament have a power? So a way for the parliament to ensure um, that they still have control over, um, over subsidy legislation is by way of including laying provisions. So what are laying provisions? Laying provisions are generally provisions which require the subsidy legislation before it can be passed effectively as a law. It would it is required for it to be tabled in the parliament and passed by the parliament as well. So that is a way for we to have legislative control um, over subsidy legislation. And the third one is um, is something that I really like doing, which is consultation. So previously. Prior to the year 2013, consultation for subsidy legislations are only made based on ad hoc basis. And this is something that will be determined by the implementation authority. But now that we have the circular number one um, in 2013, it was issued by the Secretary General um, back then. Every new legislation or legislation related to businesses, investment, and trade to be amended must undergo regulatory impact analysis. So regulatory impact analysis, one of the most core um, principle in relation to regulatory impact analysis is public consultation. So um, I know this is a bit of a shameless plug, but I just want to say that this series will also include a talk on public consultation and general principles in relating, uh, relating to RIA. And I think this is like, it's going to be very, very interesting. So if you are interested, please stay on and try to register for the session. And as you can see, um, we actually have 151 attendees here and it's already max. I understand that a lot more people are trying to come in. So try to register early as soon as MCC started distributing the, um, distributing the link. And, and then I will see you then again. But coming back to this presentation, we'll go into the next slide. So here we have um, seven types of subsidy legislations that we can find. And the reason why we have one number one to six and we have seven as others is because these are the types of primary, sorry, the types of subsidy legislations that are included under the definition of subsidy legislation under the Interpretation Act. So the Interpretation Act includes subsidy legislation to be one, regulation, second, um, rule, third is order, Four is bylaw, fifth is notification, six is proclamation, and seven would be the varying types of subsidy legislation that we have. So 
So let's take a look at some of the examples that we have for the for all of these varying types of uh, subsidy legislation. So for the first one um, would be the regulation. So what is the scope? So this is how do you differentiate again um, the varying types of subsidy legislation? We typically look into the scope and the language and the substance of that particular regulation as I'm um, sorry subsidy legislation. In particular, we would look um, into the into the intention of the subsidy legislation and then we can differentiate them from one another so if we look into regulation regulations are generally impositions of regulations by government backed by the use of penalties that are intended specifically to oversee social and economic behavior of the public so um, i also just want to highlight that the, all of this scope that we have and definition that we have in relation to the varying types of subsidy legislations our general understanding and broad scope that we um, we see uh, they're not um, they are not necessarily a legal definition because I'm not sure if there is um, something like that out there. Again, one more quiz for everyone. If you know, if you can find a specific legislation that defines um, the varying types of subsidy legislations, please put it in the comment box as well so I can learn something from the audience as well. Um, so if you want to look into the example of regulations, we can see, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide, please? So um, regulations are generally, like I mentioned just now, um, the one of the typical examples that we can use is uh, the Tourism Industry Act, where the, the requirement to be licensed is stipulated under the primary legislation, but the subsidy legislation actually talks about the licensing bit of, um, of licensing such activity um, under the primary legislation. So um, the, the, the example that we have here, would be the Companies Commission of Malaysia licensing of secretaries regulations. So as you can see, the typically under the, um, if you can take a look at the um, at the table of content, you can see that it has interpretation. It also have revocation of licenses. So this, like I mentioned, these are the nitty gritty details that are not typically included in the primary act, but they are included in subsidy legislation for better governance and implementation and effectiveness, sorry, and effectiveness of implementation. So moving on to the next type of subsidy legislation. We have rules. So rules are generally a set of principles governing um, the conduct or procedure within a particular area of activity. So we have, um, what do I mean by this, right? So rules are typically found for incorporation acts. So statutory bodies in Malaysia um, are called statutory bodies because they were incorporated pursuant to a primary legislation establishing them. So under each primary legislation for an incorporation act, for example, MPC, they will have like a provision where they set up the committee that will oversee um, the implementation um, or that can you know, carry out certain activities or roles and responsibilities provided under the incorporation act. So rules are here to actually govern their conduct. So meaning to say, what are the, um, what are the roles and responsibilities of the committee? Um, how often should the committee um, meet up? Or what are the response, uh, what is the reporting requirement? So these are all laid out in the rules of, um, of, of, the, of that particular statutory body. Um, and if you want to compare it to the private sector, it's something similar to what we have in relation to terms of reference or board charter. So it lays out the provisions as to how the committee should behave and conduct themselves as, the statu as, the, as a body overseeing the statutory body. Um, and so another example that we can also have in relation to rule is uh, we have, when it comes to regulating an activity, so here, um, an example that we use is companies' corporate rescue mechanism in 2018. So if you look into this particular subsidy legislation, one of the new mechanisms to save companies that is provided under the Companies Act is called corporate rescue mechanism. But these rules are meant to lay out what are the requirements, what are the procedures in relation to actually for you to obtain and use um, the principle of corporate rescue mechanism to save your company. So this is another example. So like I said, it could either be rules 
uh, in relation to conduct of people or um, people um, and um, authority, as well as it could also be rules um, in relation to um, the certain principles and activities under the primary legislation. Can we move on? Um, if we look into the next one, it will be order. And of course, order is the scope is an authoritative command or instruction. And I feel like I may not have to explain much on this because, and this order is the reason why we're doing this webinar instead of doing like a talk and face-to-face um, -face basis. Um, basically, the order that all of us are very familiar with is called the movement control order. So the movement control order is just there to just give a specific instruction for the public to follow. So, um, and typically the order is supplemented by regulations. So the examples that we have here, we have the movement control order, and we also have the regulations um, that is issued supplementing, not pursuant to the order, but the regulation is issued under the primary legislation, supplementing the order to include, for example, the list of essential services. So as you can see, whenever they have different intention, so order is meant to give a command. So the regulation is meant to provide clarity to the public. So that's basically how it's easier for you to differentiate what are the purposes of having these varying types of subsidy legislation. So another type of subsidy legislation, uh, they are called bylaws. So bylaws are basically subsidy legislations that are issued by local authorities at the state level. As you can, um, as you all know, that we have three levels of government. We have the federal government, we have the state government, as well as we have the local authorities as uh, the local government um, for the local authority jurisdiction. So what I mean by this is that the bylaws are so uh, we have. Um, this primary legislation called the Local Government Act 1976. Um, and Local Government Act 1976 empowers local authorities to issue their own bylaws in relation to governing activities um, that is listed um, in an exhaustive list under the Local Government Act 19, um, 1976. So um, it is interesting to see this because if you look into the Local Government Act and if you look into the subsidy legislation, um, and this is something that I'll be sharing next week as well in relation to the development, the regulatory development process for bylaws. Um, there, for federal territories, um, they're actually issued un, um, as federal instruments only because um, the state authority for federal territories is Kementerian Wilayah Pesukut One. So that is a bit of a teaser of what we'll be talking about next week. Um, but generally, for now, what we must understand in relation to bylaws, uh, these are the type of reg um, this start, these are the laws that are passed and issued and made by the local authorities to govern matters that are provided to them under the Local Government Act 1976. So, for example, um, what do we have for bylaws, right? So, um, the Local Government Act allow local authorities to license certain activities such as trade and businesses. So under that provision, it says that local authorities are allowed to pass bylaws. So that is why the local authorities would then issue bylaws in relation to licensing of trade and businesses and other types of activities that is provided. Um, so like I said, this is quite similar to regulation, but on um, but at the but the, at the level of local authorities, because typically bylaws are there to stipulate the nitty gritty and the details in relation to the licensing, in relation to, um, I don't know, like, um, like uh, what can you do in public parks um, or what can you do in, um, in, in your kawasan perumahan and things like that. Um, maybe I can give a bit more example later on, but maybe let's just move on to the, the another type of subsidy legislation. So we also have notification. So notification is a formal declaration and publication of an order and shall to be um, shall have to be in accordance with the declared policies or in the event of the requirement of the legislation. So an example um, that we have here um, is is the is the Holidays Act, right? And as you know, 
that for example um hari raya puasa it move it doesn't have a specific date in um, a year so it moves from one date to another depending on the when you can see the anak bulan and things like that so um for notification um it would just it is easier for the implementation authority to just issue a notification to just declare when exactly do we have public holiday for hari raya puasa so notification is somewhat quite bulky macam but we have a lot of notification because it is just um and it is just a simple way of notifying the public about something and also it is important to note that the reason why these notifications are gazetted is because these are provided under the primary legislation certain announcement or certain decisions and certain implementation of activities that are done by implementation authority are required to be gazetted another example will be um under customs they have crude oil um punya legislation so every single time they want to um they want to impose a certain harga a certain um price for the crude oil they will have to actually notify and gazette a notification to announce the prices so generally notification is just to just inform the public last so to speak so and the next one would be proclamation yes so proclamation um is an act that formally declares to the general public that the government has acted in particular way typically it is used in times of emergency so like i said article 150 of the federal constitution empowers the ydpa to um to to pass any proclamation especially in relation to emergency situation as you can see in the um in 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 the example that we have here So what about the other types of um subsidy legislation? So the other types of subsidy legislation may include resolution, notice, and this can include anything that is made under the authority of the parent act if any. So here we can see this is a notice to third party and it was issued under anti-money laundering and terrorism financing act. It's just basically to inform that or oh, this is a notice to a certain number of people that are uh, this maybe you are required to do this for amla it's usually maybe a freeze of asset and things like that so that's generally um the the varying um types of subsidy legislations that we have so if we move on to the next bit that we'll be speaking on So let's take a look at the sources of primary legislation. We have laid out um, to you the Malaysian legal system. We have given you the scope of primary and subsidy legislation. Now we're going to look into the sources of primary and subsidy legislation. So here we have the house. Um, I love putting this kind of graphic because it is really easy for us to um, remember. So here the sources of law that we have in Malaysia uh, is basically we have both written and unwritten law. So for written law we have all of this list um and we have the federal legislation by the elected parliament the emergency ordinances it could be the pre medica laws the 13 state constitutions um and what is most important if we want to remember about the sources of written law in Malaysia is that the applicability the degree of applicability of all of these written laws are uh, it varies based on the provisions provided so for example the state constitutions would not be applicable at the federal state similarly the federal legislation would not be applicable at the state level so um now that we've looked into the written law let's take a look at the unwritten law as well so we have both legal and non legal sources for unwritten law so legal we have british common law and equity as well as the precedent of the malaysian superior court why do we have this legal um authority but they're unwritten we mentioned that it is unwritten because it is um we mentioned that it is unwritten because it's not it has not been gazetted or passed by any of the legislative authority that we have discussed before but it is important to use them as a reference point because um as much as we have primary legislation that lay out the principle um the the general principles of the law and then we have the subsidy legislation to provide a bit more details for um an elaboration for the provisions but we would still have a little bit of loophole or gap that will always happen and this is where um both parties 
when they have a bit of dispute, especially when it comes to businesses, they will go to the court and ask the court to actually pass um, certain ruling and to make decision. And that will also be binding. Um, and it, it, should, it should always be a matter of consideration. So even for lawyers, um, it's not enough and sufficient that we only refer to primary and subsidiary legislation. Whenever we want to pass certain opinion, we will always have to rely on um, the things that we can find under the case law. So moving on to the non-legal unwritten laws that we have in Malaysia, we have the Sharia law, basically how to kawin and all that, Malay Adat. Sorry like to disturb you. I think uh, we are running out of time. If you possibly could uh, expedite your presentations. Yep, yep. Just very quickly, uh, just give me five more minutes. I'm almost, almost done. Please bear with me. Thank you for listening. So going on to the non-legal um, and non-legal um, sources, we have, like I mentioned just now, I just want to bring your attention to the quasi-legislation and it relates to our next slide. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so for soft laws, these are, this refers to quasi-legal instruments which do not have any legally binding force, but they are very much persuasive. So these are the very two important um, examples that we can take a look at. So if you look into this one, uh, the first one, yang, um, the horizontal, is called the Guideline for the Management of Integrity and Governance Unit. So the guideline is actually issued by SPRM, which requires all JLCs and statutory body to establish and set up government and uh, governance and integrity unit within um, the particular organization. As much as SPRM issued this guideline, but it is not enforceable because it is not first issued pursuant to the pursuant to a specific. Um, specific provision under the primary legislation. It is in contrast to what we can see for, for example, circulars and guidelines issued by Bank Negara or issued by SE. Whereas if you look into the, um, the source of law, then it will say that this guideline is issued pursuant to Section 54 or Financial Services Act, for example. So that will actually be binding. In contrast to what we have here, the soft laws are not binding, but they are typically used as a reference point or they're very much persuasive. For example, as much as uh, the guidelines for the management and integrity unit are not um, are not enforceable, there's no penalty if you do not follow. But what we understand is that if you do not follow, then SPRM will report that you did not follow to the PM. So you will have you be answerable to the Prime Minister of um, the government. Lah. So the second one, just very quickly, I'm so sorry. Um, so the, the next one would be, this is our public consultation document on the guideline on short-term residential accommodation. So similarly, the guideline on SPRA is not binding and is used as a reference point for regulators to actually issue their own laws. So under this guideline, we have the broad requirements as to what you need to do and comply with to conduct SDRA, but the legal instrument enforcing this requirement are meant to be passed and made by the respective local authorities and state government. So this is, like you see, it's even though it's not binding, but you still have the degree of persuasiveness in the lawmaking process um, by other implementation authorities. Okay, can we move on to the, okay, so very quickly, so whatever that we have explained before, let's take a look at the practical application of the theories that we have discussed with you. So if you look into the overview of the Malaysian system, legal system, we have number one, the federal constitution as the supreme law that empowers the parliament to pass legislation, and then the parliament pass the primary legislation. Here we use an example of Companies Act, and the primary legislation delegates the power to an authority to implement the provisions, which include making subsidy legislation. And here we can see the example of SSM being the authority. And then SSM is empowered to pass subsidy legislation to supplement the parent act. So this is just a very um, brief overview of the Malaysian legal system. And then I would just want to bring, um, so for this presentation for part one, this would be the last slide that we have. Um, I just want to bring a bit of your attention to the last slide which is basically what we'll be talking about next week. So what will be covered next week? We will be looking into the legislative process on three levels of government, the parliament and the state, 
as well as the local authority, we will also be looking into common features of legislation, meaning how do you interpret certain terms that we can find in subsidy legislations and primary sub sorry, primary and subsidy legislations. So um and, and as well as okay, this is always like the most common question that I get is what is PUA and PUB? Yes, we will be discussing those things as well. And number three is basically if you have specific inquiries in relation to Malaysian legal system um, and, and to what we've talked about, you please put it in the chat box and we can consider to include them. Uh, and inshallah, we'll be, uh, we'll be able to address uh, your inquiries in the next session. So um, that's all for me. Thank you very much for listening to me rambling about Malaysian legal system. Um, but I would like to pass this back to Encik Lamin. Uh, thank you, Leah. I think uh, thank you, Leah and Nick. I think uh, it was a great presentation. I think uh, because uh, due to the constraint of time, I think we we have a few questions. Uh, I will select uh, I think three questions. A quick one, and then one is uh, from the uh, attendees. I will open up one only one. Uh, speaker, I mean one attendance to uh, one participant raise the hand. Uh, and then uh, first questions are from Cik Razlan, Razlan Mustafa. Uh, he asked about uh, is there any uh, is there a section in the law that state that if the YDPA Yang Deputu Agong does not sign the approved bill, it will automatically be accepted as a law after a certain time period. Uh, Dia or Nick, do you want to? Um, I, okay, I, I, can, I can start. So basically for that question, um, if the YDPA does not approve, it goes through a process of it has to get royal assent. Um, but even if YDPA does not give the royal assent, um, after a certain period, about 30 days, that law will be deemed as if the YDPA has given his royal assent. Meaning to say that even if YDPA tak approve, the law will still be effective. So um, that would be the simple answer. If Nick wants to add, go ahead. Or if, if you think that is sufficient, we can move to other questions. Okay. All right. No. Uh, then uh, next question from Win Win O. Uh, she already left, but I think a uh, very good question. Sorry, uh, it was you. Uh, so the question is about. Uh, she asked about for the state law to be passed. Do they go through the same legislative process as the parliament? Okay, so for state laws, um, they will have to get the approval of. It will be the same process, but it will be in the one undangan agree only so they don't have to bring it to parliament lah. but the process will be the same but it's in june okay thank you uh, another one i think i take from uh, mr david david yap uh, hi may i know the difference between revision of an act and reprint of an act difference between uh, revision of act and Reprint of act. Um, reprint are just um because um, so, but we have uh we have the publication uh, organization that is under the parliament. So reprint is just basically they they reprint the new um versions uh, But revision, like I mentioned, if there are any typographical error, grammatical error, then it will be inside the revision act. So the reprint is just much um you know a new edition. Um, for that particular, um, it's just in relation to the publication bit, but not so much about amending the substance. Okay, I think uh, next, I think we I give to Cik. Uh, he raised her hand. I open up your mic. Cik Anwar can uh, can speak. Cik Anwar. Chanwa, Cik Khairul Anwar. And Cik Khairul Anwar, you can you can ask the question to the speakers. 
Can I? I already uh, unmute. Uh, it's okay. So I think uh, we 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 actually we already uh, um, end of our session because uh, our webinar session is a, uh, an hour, a one hour session. So we already uh, passed to 11 minutes. So I think um, I think that's all. Uh, thank you, uh, both of you. Uh, it was a very good presentation, a great presentation. Uh, I think um, we will uh, meet again next week on the part two, as mentioned by uh, Yeah. So uh, for, uh, for next week, we do also have a, a programs. Uh, if you interested, uh, we have a, a on 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 twentieth. Uh, we have a delivery construction permit works during and post COVID nineteen information on twenty uh, April, uh, and also. Uh, on, on the 30 apples, uh, agro food supply chain ability to assess affordable food effectively and continuously. So uh, it's also on 20, 20 apples. Uh, 20 April, uh, we will uh, email and send uh, the the flyers uh, to all the people. Uh, if you are interested on this topic, uh, please join. And also uh, uh, don't forget to register again for part two on our understanding of nation uh, revolutions. So uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for uh, listening. Uh, I think I was uh, uh, happy with the session and see you all again. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. <laughs>